I guess it was the night the angel appeared that my journey really started. The words, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you, played over and over in my mind. I knew my life would never be the same. The night everything changed was a night that started like every other. We were watching our flocks when everything went bright around us. And then that, that angel appeared and told us, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And then all of a sudden, there were more angels and there was all this singing and it was all so overwhelming and wonderful and holy and just remarkable. I wondered to myself, is this really happening? When I look back, it's like we were wandering and lost our whole lives until we met that baby boy savior. I guess you could call us truth seekers, knowledge pursuers, or something of that nature. We wandered after that star for months and months, seeking the answer to this life, this existence, this world we live in. We wondered what we would find at the end of our journey. Would this be the answer to everything that we had been searching for? The words the angel said next were perhaps even more shocking. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. His kingdom will never end. This baby, my son, would be our king forever? This baby would be our Messiah, the Savior we've been waiting for? This baby would end our waiting and watching and wondering? I didn't understand it fully, but somehow, I knew it to be true. This baby king we were about to wander our way to was the Messiah, the promised one, the one who would save us. But who were we? Just a bunch of lowly shepherds. We were nobodies. But to him, I knew that we mattered. We were somebodies. There was some greater purpose for our lives. We didn't have to wonder anymore if there was a God out there who cared about us, loved us even. No more wandering the fields at night feeling insignificant and alone. This was Emmanuel, God with us. We couldn't believe what we found, a baby, a king in a manger. And yet, there he was, everything we had ever searched for, the answers our souls craved, satisfied, the longings in our hearts fulfilled, our deepest places of emptiness filled. Our wandering was over, our wondering was over, in that little baby named Jesus. wondered if I could really believe all this God and Jesus stuff. Wondered, what's really true? I've always wondered if there could be more to life than this, and if there is any meaning or greater purpose for my life. 
Will I ever find the answers? Or will I be wondering and wandering forever? I wonder as I wander. Good evening, everybody, and Merry Christmas to everybody that is in the room and to everybody watching online. I'm so glad that you made some time to be here with us, either in body or in spirit, this Christmas Eve. The great writer, historian, and mystic, Abraham Joshua Heschel, once said these words. Not once in my life did I ask God for success or fame or wealth or power. Instead, what I asked God for was wonder, and he granted it to me. I find this to be a fascinating idea. The idea that if you could ask God for anything, that you wouldn't ask him for success, wealth, fame, or power, but that you would ask him for wonder. What is wonder anyways? How would you define it? Heschel defines it this way. He says that it is the attitude of being radically amazed by life. It is the decision to not take anything for granted, to go through life saying, phenomenal, incredible, amazing. You know who I think captures this spirit the most among us? Children of which we have some in the room, but I see wonder on the faces of my children more than I see it anywhere else in my life and more than I experience it even in my own life. A couple of nights ago, we brought them to the movies and I strategically got us at the back of the theater so that I could kind of be on my phone during the movie because I didn't think it would capture my attention really. But throughout the whole movie, they were tugging at my elbows, dad, dad, the lion, the gorilla, the pig. Like it was just, we were watching Sing too, by the way. If you're like, what are they watching? They were, they were filled with wonder, the wonder of the big screen and the coming to life of these imaginary animals. Last summer, we took them to the zoo and the height of the zoo experience was gonna be when we got to the cheetah exhibit. Except for that the cheetah exhibit's like two hours at the back of the zoo. But finally, two hours into being at the zoo, we get to the cheetah exhibit. And just our luck, the cheetah is right there at the glass. And my kids get to be face to face with the cheetah. And their whole beings lit up and they turn to me, Dad, did you know that that is the fastest land animal on the planet? I'm like, oh, you guys have been watching National Geographic in preparation for this. A couple summers ago, we stayed up late. We were at Lake Huron. We stayed up late, what was late for them, to watch the sun go down. And the wonder on their faces, the radically being amazed that they experienced, like as the sun looked like it was going down into the lake. Dad, does this happen every night? Is this normal? Will the sun come back? Filled with wonder. Everything's incredible, amazing, phenomenal. Another writer, Scott Erickson, who talks about wonder and writes about wonder, frames it a little bit differently. He says that we live these lives of routine and rhythm and things are all just kind of familiar. Everything's kind of familiar. This is what our human brains do. We need it to be safe and so we make it simple and familiar. And so the drive to work, the drive to work isn't the car, amazing. Look at the buildings. Oh, like imagine if we were all driving to work filled with wonder and we we're waving at everyone. Oh, I, you have one of those too? Oh my God, this is so amazing. Like it's not that. It's just, oh, of course, we're driving. This is familiar. We do this every day. When, when we're in our houses, 
Do you think when your house is, my house has heating and cooling and toilets. Oh my goodness. I mean, we should be amazed every time we flush the toilet. Where does it go? I don't know. I'm glad I don't have to deal with it. This is amazing, incredible. We should be filled with wonder, but we're not. It's all just kind of familiar. Erickson says wonder is the experience when we break free from the familiar and when we are rapturously brought into the present, when we get caught up in the present moment, when we are fully alive, experiencing the glorious now. That's what wonder is. When I think about my own life, I think, where have I experienced wonder? Where can I tangibly see it, taste it, feel it the most? I think of the birth of my three children. Not all at the same time, one at a time. But the first one was in the hospital and it was the first one. And so everything was new and everything was amazing. And, and it was an amazing experience where I was fully present and just broke down as a father in tears holding my son for the first time. But for the second two, my wife decided, let's spice it up a little bit. Let's have them at home on purpose. Because who needs hundreds of years of medical innovation? Let's do Little House on the Prairie. So we had our second two children at home and it was a different experience of wonder. I think there was, I, I could be wrong, I think there was a lot more like fluid in this, in this experience. There was a lot, more, a lot more goop and a lot more blood in this experience. And, and I, was, I, was, I had a task, I had many tasks to do in these experiences. I wasn't just the spectator dad, everything looks good here in the hospital. You, I was right in there, I was in the tub at one point, in the goop. I was, I was doing this thing, guys, if you ever are lucky enough to get to do this, where you gotta press on your wife's hips because apparently that alleviates all of the pain and it makes you feel just like a champion in the room. I'm sure it doesn't do any of that, but, but I'm pressing on the hips and for, for my daughter, when she was born, I actually got to deliver her, take her out and then do the, the cutting of the cord. But it was an extreme experience of wonder. Never have I been so fully present. And I was filled with wonder at my wife. Man, I had never seen such determination on her face. I never realized how selfless she could be as she gave up her body to bring another human into the world. The strength that she displayed. Like I was just in wonder of who is this woman that I married? Who are you women that bring all of us into the world? You guys are amazing. What, what fills you with that kind of wonder? The radical amazement of being brought into the glorious now. Does this season fill you with wonder? I think it should. I think this is supposed to be a season of wonder. As you read through the different accounts and stories and characters in the Bible that tell us about the Christmas season, the coming to earth of Jesus, I think they're supposed to fill us with wonder. I think of the story of the shepherds. What are the shepherds doing? They're, they're watching their sheep at night. What is that? That is a familiar routine for them. They're not there thinking, this is the greatest night ever. They're thinking, another night shift. They're not looking up, the, up at the stars going, I've never seen a sky like this. They're thinking, this is the same sky. They may probably didn't even look up. I've seen those stars a million times. All we gotta do is make sure that one wolf over there doesn't come and get any sheep. Other than that, we're gonna be good for the night, boys. And into this familiar setting, the sky cracks open and an angel appears and the glory of God shone around them, and they were terrified. And the angel says to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And if that wasn't enough, then the sky broke open even more and a host of heavenly angels filled the sky and they all began singing glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now maybe if you just read the story, you think I've heard that story a million times, but if you put yourself in the shoes of those shepherds, what that experience must have been like wonder. I mean, they would have been so hyped. Come on, boys, we got a baby to find. This is going to be incredible. Is that your experience of this night? Maybe it has been because that drum opening was pretty killer. But is it a wondrous season or has it become a little bit too familiar? 
How about this? How about, how about the idea of God becoming a human? All throughout the Old Testament, we get a consistent witness from people who experience the glory and the presence of God. Do you know what their consistent witness is? You know what they tell us what that's like when you encounter God? It's this. Oh God, get away from me, please. Oh, you're too holy. I can't be in your presence. This is too scary. Like, get away. You're going to kill me. You're going to destroy me. Consistently in the Old Testament, that is the witness. If you experience the presence of God, it will make you cower. This is the experience that the shepherds have when the angel first appears to them. The glory of God shines around them and they are terrified. But from there, they get sent to find God somewhere else, in a manger, in a body. And in that manger was the, goal, was the glory of God, no less than the glory of God. Except it was revealing something different about his character, that he could be vulnerable, that he could be humble, that he could come as tiny baby Jesus who don't even know a word yet. The infinite, holy, face-melting God when he needs to decide, how shall I make my grand entrance into this magnificent story that I am telling? Shall I come with thunderclouds? Shall I come with a loud bang? Shall I come as a 30-year-old male so that I can tell these people what they need to, to hear? Or should I come as a baby? Why, why does God do that? Why does he come as a baby? I think it's to reveal to us the heart of the Father. That he wants to reach us. That he wants to be close to us. And so he comes in the least threatening form possible. Let me come as a baby who can't even speak yet. Maybe then they'll be able to get close to me. And this Jesus would grow in stature. And he would go on to reveal to us more about the Father, that the Father is love. And he would teach us to walk in the way of love. He called it his kingdom. And then he would model for us, how, how, what does love look like? Just how extreme can this love get? And he would model that for us by dying on a cross for our sins. What kind of God writes a story like this, where he would take center stage as a baby. Heschel writes something else really interesting about wonder. He says that wonder precedes faith. Meaning before you get to faith, you gotta have an experience of wonder. But the determining factor of whether or not your experience of wonder leads to faith has to do with what you do with the wonder that you experience. What do you do when you encounter wonder, when you see the cheetah, the childbirth, the baby in a manger? What do you do with that? Because you can ignore it. You can slough it off. You can rationalize it away. You can refuse to let it do its work in you. Or you can yield to it. You can yield to the wonder and let it do its work in you. And you know what its work does in you? It makes you feel small and finite and fragile. What it does to you is it makes you feel like a child. And when you allow it to do this work in you, wonder can carry you back home into the arms of your loving Heavenly Father. And so maybe you're in one of two places tonight. Maybe you're in the place where you'd be like, Pete, I got faith, man. I got faith. I believe Jesus, 100% God, 100% human, died on the cross for my sins, rose again, is inaugurating a new kingdom, and we await his glorious return. I believe it, but I believe it up here. And I'm lacking the wonder that you speak of. Maybe you're in that place. Or maybe you're in the place if you were really honest and you say, Pete, I, I actually don't have any faith. 
I'm here because somebody brought me here and promised me cookies and there was no cookies and we got to wear masks. I know, I liked it better when there was cookies and coffee too. One day, one day we'll get back there. But maybe that's you, you're like, I don't have, I don't have any faith. Well, regardless of which of these two places you're in, tonight I wanted to invite you to make this your prayer this Christmas season, that we would together ask God for wonder. Because wonder can reinvigorate our faith. It can make our faith come alive again. But wonder also precedes faith in the first place. And so so for some of us, asking God for wonder is gonna be asking that he would begin to lead us and plant some beginning seeds of faith in our heart. So I invite you to make this your prayer this season. Ask God for wonder. If you wanna make that your prayer, then would you join me in prayer right now? God, of all the things we could ask you for, success, wealth, fame, power, we put all of those aside and we ask, would you give us wonder? Would you fill us with radical amazement? Bring us into the present moment, into the glorious now where you want to meet us. God, we ask for a fresh dose of your wonder that would make us feel like children again and carry us back into the arms of our loving Heavenly Father. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for what you've done for us. We stand in awe and wonder of who you are. And we ask for wonder in your name. Amen.